So the DT1990 Pro is a successor to Biodynamics' very popular DT990 Pro. And since its introduction in 2016, it's been repeatedly praised for its supreme resolution as well as its ability to highlight errors made in the recording and mastering process. In this video, I want to find out whether or not it actually lives up to that reputation. Hey everyone, it's Chrono from The Headphone Show, and today we'll of course be looking at how the DT1990 Pro performs. But before that, let's go over the basics. The DT1990 Pro retails for $599, and like its predecessor, it's an open back dynamic headphone intended for studio reference mixing and mastering. The build on the DT1990 Pro is flawless. It feels extremely well put together, and just about everything on this headphone is made out of metal. Still, these manage to remain fairly light at only 380 grams. The headband is made of what, to me, feels like very nice pleather. It's also very nicely padded. I did not get any sort of hot spots on my head when wearing these for a long time. With the DT1990 Pro, you get two sets of pads. As expected from Biodynamic, the velour on these is second to none. They're admittedly a little on the shallow side, so my ear does occasionally touch the driver. Still, I feel like I can wear these pretty much indefinitely. While both sets of pads look and feel very similar, they're actually not the same, and they do provide some slight tuning changes to the DT1990 Pro. The ones that come installed by default are what Biodynamic calls their balanced pads, and that's indicated by them having several cutouts on the back of the pad. The ones that I actually used the most for listening were the analytical pads, which only have four cutouts on the back. Um, I personally thought that these sounded better, and that's why I listened to them the most, but I will be talking about how they, uh, how they each sound uh, in the sound section of this video. Biodynamic has finally made the cable detachable on the DT1990 Pro, so you get two cables included. One is a 3 meter straight cable, and the other one is a 5 meter coiled cable. I only use the straight cable because I'm not really a big fan of coiled cables, and while I do admit it's a bit on the long side, it was very easy to wrap up so it made it very comfortable for desktop use. Regardless, both cables are actually very similar. They're both 3 pin mini XLR to 3.5 millimeter, and they each have their own thread on quarter inch adapter. Lastly, you get this rather large hard shell case. It's not particularly portable, but it should keep your 1990s safe should you need to carry them around. Okay, so we finally get to talk about sound. So how does the DT1990 Pro perform? I think I'll start off by saying that it's definitely an upgrade over the DT990 Pro. However, it still has some serious issues in the trouble, but more on that later. Additionally, at their price of $600, I don't know if their technical performance actually lives up to asking price. But anyways, before I spoil the conclusion to this video, let's get right into the sound review. So like I usually do, I'll start off by talking about bass, which I think is actually fairly impressive on the DT1990 Pro, especially when you consider that it's an open back dynamic headphone around the $500 price range. So these don't actually start to roll off uh, until around 40 hertz, and they only do so very gently, so they have very good extension, and that's a huge upgrade over the DT990 Pro, which started to roll off very aggressively at around 70 hertz, so very early. I also thought that the bass on these was quite well defined, you know, they had good resolution in the bass, they had a, a pretty good sense of speed. I, I didn't think that they were quite as detailed as the LCD-1 in Sundara, but I did think that they were a little more refined sounding than the HD660S. Now, uh, I did have one issue though, and that is that there's, there seems to be an elevation at 250Hz, so the upper bass bleeds a little bit into the lower mids, and that just took away some of the cleanliness, but overall I still thought that the bass on these was you know, quite articulate and it had a good sense of depth. Um, with the balance pads, the overall bass level seems to rise a little bit. However, to me, it came across as a little bloated and it also emphasized that elevation at 250 hertz. So I personally thought or, or preferred the analytical pads because to me, it sounded cleaner. Moving on to the mid range, I think that at least for tonality, they're pretty good. In terms of frequency response, they adhere very closely to what I consider to be neutral sounding. The only deviation I found here is that there's a small peak at 2.5K that I thought made some singers as well as some instruments, mainly electric guitars and brass instruments, come across as a little uh, boxy or honky. But aside from that, I did think they, that they had a very good tonal balance in the mid range. The timbre is also greatly improved from the DT990 Pro. The 990 sounded a little metallic to me, whereas these, the 1990, sound a lot more natural and transparent. 
where the mids kind of disappoint me is in resolution. Now, don't get me wrong, they don't have like a bad level of detail. It's just that they're only ever so slightly faster than the LCD one in Sandara. Like it's a very narrow margin of improvement. And these are almost twice the price at their MSRP of 599. Additionally, I didn't think that they were actually quite as clean in their delivery of the mids as the HD660S, which I've also been testing recently. So yeah, the tonality and timbre is good, but I don't know if the resolution is really there for their asking price of $600. Um, with the bounce pads, I didn't like the way that the mid sounded, so I'm just gonna recommend the analytical pads again. Uh, I suppose that they give the uh, the DT1990 Pro a somewhat V-shaped kind of sound signature when you put on the balance pads. And to me, they just sounded a little too far recessed, too dark, so yeah, just I prefer the analytical pads again. I think it sounds a lot more accurate. Okay, so now we get to the section of the DT1990 Pro's frequency response that is without a doubt the most controversial, and that is of course the high. So it seems like there are two conflicting schools of thought surrounding this headphone's trouble. The first one, and arguably more popular one, is that this headphone is extremely detailed and resolving in the highs. So much so that if anything comes across as unpleasant when listening to them, that is a fault of the recording or something went wrong in the mastering process. The second opinion is that the treble on this headphone is drastically over sharpened. So much so that it gives off a false sense of detail. After listening to them extensively and testing them, my opinion supports the latter. I find the treble on the DT1990 Pro to be quite unfortunate because honestly, the rest of its frequency response is actually very good. However, the treble, and it really only boils down to this one peak, completely throws off this headphone's tonal balance and it makes them, at least in my experience, really fatiguing to listen to very quickly. Now, the one peak I'm talking about is this peak at 8.5K in an excess of like 10 to 12 dB. And this one peak has a couple of different effects, all negative, on the sound of the DT1990 Pro. So the first thing is that it seems to add this shimmery, kind of shiny sound quality to the DT1990 Pro. And I think that it's actually that attribute that contributes the most to the perception that this is a supremely detailed headphone. The second thing is that and this becomes very apparent when toggling EQ on and off, is that it has like this sizzle quality going on in the background all the time. You just hear like a pss. And I find it ironic because instead of the over sharpened treble showing detail, I actually think that it, if anything, it hides detail and actually completely hides other elements in the music you listen to. Like I was listening to, you know, Jazz at the Pawn Shop, which is a, an album that was recorded live to capture the energy of a, a live performance. So naturally, you should be able to hear things like audience members and ambient sounds. However, that sizzle in the background is so loud that it, sometimes it completely drowns out those elements and just basically hides them from the mix. And then the last thing, and this is probably expected, this is a very sibilant headphone. Things like consonant sounds, S's and T's, as well as instrument harmonics, like cymbal crashes and splashes can become, you know, piercing very fast. So yeah, that, this one peak, I think, really ruins the sound of the DT1990 Pro for me. And I mean, there is another peak um, in the treble, but it's nowhere near as bad. It's just a, a peak at 5.5K that I think emphasizes a little bit of that mid-range honk, as well as, you know, adds a little bit, little bit of glare, but it's nowhere near as bad as the peak at 8.5K. Now, when you EQ those peaks down, what you find is that the treble resolution here is actually not all that great. Uh, I actually found the treble on these to be fairly hazy. I thought that the LCD1 Sandara were actually much cleaner in their delivery of the highs than the, uh, than the DT1990 Pro and the HD660S as well, actually. I thought that the 660S, yes, the treble is darker, but I thought that it was actually a lot more resolving than on the DT1990 Pro. So yeah, the, the treble resolution is just really, really not there for the price tag. Um, just very quickly, <laughs> the balance pads, 
I don't think they actually change the treble that much. From frequency response graphs I've seen online, it doesn't seem to change them. And I didn't really hear any differences. It didn't cool down the treble or anything like, like that at all. Uh, if anything, maybe it sounded a little more emphasized just because I guess they get a more V-shaped sound. So they, they, the highs seemed a little hotter just because the, the mids were so recessed. But aside from that, I mean, I don't think the balance pads really alleviate the highs at all. So yeah, just really unfortunate. <laughs> Okay, so I'm sure you're tired of me talking about frequency response, so let's move on to um, soundstage and imaging, which on this headphone, it's great. The soundstage here, I personally think it's, it's fairly wide. It has a very even spatial distribution. I think it's actually quite roomy. Um, the imaging as well is incredibly clean. Like if you want a headphone that, you know, is very clear at distinguishing what direction sounds are coming from, I think this is great, which uh, and when you combine those two things, the soundstage and the imaging, I know it's not their intended use, but I think that this is an amazing headphone for gaming, especially for first-person shooters. It's the same thing I set with for the DT990 Pro. Um, the only thing that I found kind of odd is that the instrument separation wasn't actually that amazing. I actually had an easier time distinguishing the different layers and in, in different tracks um, on things like the HD660S, which it doesn't have nearly as good a soundstage or imaging as the DT1990 Pro. So yeah, uh, soundstage and imaging, fantastic. Uh, instrument separation, a little lacking, but you know, still good. Dynamics is another department where I think the uh, DT1990 Pro performs really well. I mean, this is a punchy headphone. Like you listen to things like kick drums, this will deliver that immediate impact. These have a really good sense of punch and slam. They're actually quite fun and enjoyable to listen to. Microdynamics were also good. You know, you, you feel like the tension and the weight with which instruments are played. So it really gives uh, music a, a very engaging and lively quality on the DT1990 Pro. So yeah, dynamics, very good. Before we wrap up the video, I would just want to touch up really quickly up on uh, EQ because I actually think that these respond really well to EQ. You can easily alleviate that roll off as well as clean up the upper bass. Um, very easy just with a 1.5 uh, dB uh, dip at 2.5K that gets rid of the honk completely. Um, the highs, they don't really keep any of their edge but um, it really reveals how hazy the resolution is for the highs on there, but at least it sounds a lot more enjoyable. If you wanna give EQ a, a try, I have made a preset for these and you'll be able to find it in my uh, EQ compilation post that I made on the headphone community forums and the link will that, for that will be in the description down below. So what's my conclusion on these? Well, I think it's very clear by now that I don't really think that they live up to a reputation of being resolution kings. And on top of that, for me, the treble was just too piercing. And I'm gonna say it again, it's, it's a shame because the rest of its frequency response is actually good. Now, with the EQ, I quite enjoy these, but they take quite a bit of EQ to get to the point where I think that they sound really good. And even then, I don't think that they perform quite as well as the other headphones that I've mentioned so far. Um, and at 599, they start getting dangerously close to things like the Hi-Fi Man Ananda and Focal Elex, which, you know, they handily outperform it in most categories. So I think that at $600, it's a bit of a tough sell. Uh, if they drop in price to 400, maybe 450, I think that, you know, especially VQ, I think that they're worth considering. They still have, you know, they still have good resolution. It's just not anything extraordinary. And uh, they also have some good attributes like the soundstage and the dynamics being very good. So um, yeah, that's all from me today. I hope you found this video helpful. I hope you enjoyed it. You did, do consider dropping a like. And if you want more headphone and audio content, do consider subscribing to The Headphone Show. Until next time, this is Chrono signing off.